Uh, good evening uh, to the audience joining on Radio Sofia for yet another very keenly awaited session. And a very good morning to our respected speaker for today, Dr. Vijendra Rao, uh, joining us all the way from the United States of America. Uh, it's my pleasure and privilege to introduce you all to Dr. Rao, who is currently the lead economist in the development research group of the World Bank. He works at the intersection of scholarship and practice and integrates his training in economics with theories and methods from anthropology, sociology, and political science to study the social, cultural, and political context of extreme poverty in developing countries. His research has spanned a variety of subjects on issues related to dowries, domestic violence, and sex work using an interdisciplinary and mixed method approach. Apart from publications in leading journals and books, Dr. Rao leads the social observatory with which he has been associated since 2011, which is an interdisciplinary effort to embed researchers within large-scale interventions and help improve the capacity for local collective action. And on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the social observatory, Dr. Rao would be sharing some of those stories and how research could be embedded into practice. Thank you, Dr. Rao, once again uh, for accepting the invite as we look forward to an interesting session ahead. Uh, over to you, sir. Thank you, Madri. It's a pleasure to talk to all of you. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen because I have a presentation. Uh, it's disabled, Madri. Uh, you can do it now, sir. Can everybody see that? Yeah, it's absolutely visible. Okay, so let me just start from the beginning, of course. Okay, so uh, could, could, could you put it on uh, like full screen mode? Yeah, doing that now. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so. Um, you know, I'm, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, approximately 10 years now, a little more than 10 years actually, of the work we've been doing with something called the, that we call the Social Observatory, which is really an effort to rethink how research intersects with policy. Um, I've summarized some of this in an article that was published a couple of years ago in Daedalus, uh, if you're interested to sort of see the argument in written form. But what I'll do is I'll give you some of the sort of conceptual theoretical sort of ideas behind the social observatory and how it positions itself from other types of policy making. And, uh, and then I'll give you a, a couple of examples. We've done a lot of things, so I won't be able to go through everything. It's on our website, which you can see there. But I will highlight a couple of things that we have done so you'll get a flavor of the approach that we have followed uh, over this period. It still goes on. So I'll talk about some of the work that we've also been doing uh, currently. Yeah. Um, now, what I should sort of make clear here is that the talk is as much about the social observatory, but also about a perspective of how economists and social scientists more generally uh, can make policy intervention better. Uh, that is not just about RCTs or about you know, uh, theoretical uh, approaches but is what I call an embedded approach uh, to, for the, about the intersection. So let, so let, me, let me get started. Uh, let's go this way. There we go. Okay. So, you know, if you think about how we do policy in the world, all, all over the world, these are not uh, just unique to India, but literally all over the world, uh, there are three major approaches uh, that, you know, at least I can think of. And keep in mind that, you know, when you're making an argument of this kind, there are always going to be overlaps and, you know, somebody will say, well, you know, this is not quite that, this is not quite this. So it's not a strict distinction. They're, they're what, you know, Max Weber called ideal types. Uh, they characterize different ways of doing policy. So the three that I'm going to talk about are neoliberal, neo-Keynesian, and neo-paternalistic. And I'll explain what they are. Let's start with neoliberal. This you all know. Uh, you know, think about uh, Friedman or Hayek and people like that. It starts from a basic skepticism about social science, that as social scientists, uh, you know, human beings uh, have an 
intrinsic inability to understand human behavior very well. Yeah. So therefore, the idea then becomes, since we have this inability to understand human behavior really well, let us leave people alone, let's say fair, yeah? let's leave people alone. Because there is a skepticism about the ability of government to fix problems because at the end, social scientists are advising government. So both because of government and state imperfections, the inability of social science to understand them, you rely on the invisible hand of the market. Okay? And this is coupled very, very sort of closely with an emphasis on individual rights and on electoral democracy. Uh, and of course, the grand characters here are the, are, are the Austrians, the largely Hayek, Schumpeter, and the other Austrians. Uh, uh, you know, have written most eloquently about this. Milton Friedman, uh, more currently, and of course, there are others who write about it now. But the basic way, the route out of poverty, following a, a neoliberal approach, is to maximize growth, as they say. You know, a rising tide lifts all boats, and that uh, helps us reduce poverty. Okay, so this is sort of just a characterization of what you know, neoliberal, neo Keynesian is a reaction to neoliberalism, okay? And here, of course, Stiglitz, Akerlof, all the great, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, and of course, Keynes himself, uh, of, 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 of uh, economists of, of, of the second half of the 20th century, with a great focus on two issues, market failure and inequality, yeah? And the role of the government here is to intervene to correct market, market failures and to improve inequality of opportunity, yeah? So here, there's a greater reliance, a greater belief that as social scientists, as economists and sociologists and so on, we can understand human behavior quite well, and therefore we can give advice about how to solve market failure problems. So in effect, it becomes an expert-led way of doing policy making. Uh, there are very many sort of remedies that, that, that are also exist to correct inequality, affirmative action being one of them, legal remedies to ensure equal access, and of course, it all rests on the presumption of electoral democracy. That is, we don't like how a government works. You vote it out, bring another government in. And it's basically the way policy is done in most parts of the world. And if you want to look at the historical antecedents of this, you can go back uh, even to Chanakya in India. I mean, it goes back many, many years, uh, many uh, millennia. Um, and a and, and, and lot of uh, government programs rely on this kind of approach uh, for social protection, healthcare, minimum wages, and so on, all over the world. Of course. It very much characterizes uh, policy in India, uh, particularly uh, since independence. Any sort of welfare as policy will fall under the category of neo Keynes. So that's also well known. Maybe what is slightly less uh, uh, sort of defined is what I'm calling neo paternalism. And by the way, I don't mean them as perjurative titles. Yeah, I'm giving them labels because I think they re they reflect the thinking behind them. And I don't mean to say that one is better than the other, or what I'm proposing is better than these. But just to help us clear our heads, what is neopaternalism? Neopaternalism is a more extreme version of neo-Keynesianism. The basic idea is that we are so good now, and this is a 21st century uh, phenomenon, we are so good now with machine learning, with uh, uh, RCTs, with behavioral models, in understanding human behavior, that at the end, what we have to really do is to apply our heads to figuring out the right way, the most evidence-based way to change policymakers, yeah? And the broad thinking here is that poverty is really, uh, uh, really affected by individual, what, what Mulinathan and Safri call uh, the scarcity of attention and poor options. So the capacity to choose, a poor person to choose is constrained because of cognitive limitations, which justifies the role of government to solve those cognitive uh, limitations, you know, nudges of different kinds, the, the, the Taylor idea, the Taylor and Sunstein idea of a nudge, yeah? which is really saying we are so smart that we can tell the government exactly how to fiddle around with people's heads so that they will behave better, they will save better, they will, they will invest better, they will send their kids to school better, uh, conditional transfers of different kinds, they all fall under new paternalism. Of course, the RCT, uh, evidence-based revolution, uh, Banerjee Duflo, uh, and so on, um, uh, and Kremer uh, is, 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 I would argue, a part of this. In, in many ways, it is the opposite end of neoliberalism. Yeah? If neoliberalism says that social scientists really don't know anything, neopaternalism says social scientists know, in fact, a lot. And there's a great belief in the power of social science to understand the causes of poverty and how to solve it. And then, of course, the great power of data, belief in the power of data and causal identification to randomize uh, trials uh, and so on. Yeah? The basic point here is that policy needs to be predicated on research and evidence. Policy has to come from that, informed by social science. 
Yeah. And, and really here, the idea really is, if you think about RCTs, largely the focus is on getting the design right. If we design the right intervention and we test it in a randomized trial, we'll get things correctly. Yeah? The focus is less on implementation. The fact that a design, I mean, the, the, the standard critiques of RCT, you know, you know, uh, external validity uh, and so on. But, but, but if you get the design right, the focus is less for some reason implementation. There are some RCTs done on implementation itself, but that again is treating implementation as a design problem, yeah? Rather than, than of all the crazy stuff that we know goes on in governments, yeah? And the emphasis at the end comes to very simple designs because complex designs are very difficult to deal with in RCTs. So you end up with very simple designs. You know, you have a conditional cash transfer, you have a, you have a, you have a simple intervention, you're providing information or something of that kind. Many, many moving parts uh, are difficult to study in the context of a new paternalist, uh, paternalistic approach, so tend to be very simple uh, interventions at the end, yeah? where implementation problems are less of an issue. What are the common elements to all three approaches? The focus is more on outcomes. What is the end result? Yeah? Rather than how do we get to that end result? Yeah? Asking, if we design something, how does it move from step to step from the first time somebody approaches a community and says, do something or, or, or starts a school to how that whole thing translates into outcome? You, you don't see much on the, what they call mechanisms. If you, if you read the literature and mechanisms in RCTs, it's like theoretical literature. We don't really understand what the mechanisms are as they actually happen. Yeah? There's a clear idea of what the world ought to look like. And interestingly, largely the concern is with solving the problem of income poverty. So you have a very welfareist view of how to deal with uh, poverty rather than a multi-dimensional approach. It's very top-down. Uh, again, premised on the idea of electoral democracy, people don't have a say, people those who are supposed to be affected by these things don't have a say in these interventions except through the electoral process. Implementation challenges are, are not liability. If you get, if you get, there's a too much noise involved if, if, uh, if, 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 you, if you get too, too many people involved, yeah? Okay, now where does the social observatory approach differ from this? It is basically in some ways a reaction to these three approaches, not to say that they are wrong, but to say they have something missing, which is basically that policy in our view should be as much as possible a conversation between the policymaker, the policy implementer, and the sole beneficiary the people getting the policy. They should be in a conversation, in a dialogue, in order to decide what the best approach is. Therefore, the focus is outcomes. Obviously, that's what we are interested in at the end. But we believe that if you don't focus on the process by which that outcome comes, via a process of dialogue, then, then you will not be able to do this well at scale. So therefore, from the citizen side, following Gandhiji, following Paulo Freire, following Habermas, we, be, we, we believe very much in the, in the dialogic processes that we have, which are citizen action, deliberation, working towards collective solutions. And from the government side, improving government responsiveness through adaptive implementation, the through a process of learning by doing it. You know, we rely on Hirschman, Andrew Spritchen and Woolcock have a nice book on this, about how do we improve government responsiveness by learning by doing, yeah? So, at the end, the, I mean, following Ostrom, the process is one of co-production, where that co-production process is central, where policy is not something an expert designs, but an expert maybe proposes, while the citizen receives it and says, we don't like it, do it this different, do that differently. So you're then incorporating everybody in the process by which policy is done and implemented. And you know, if you want to go to Foucault, uh, I don't know if, you, if this audience is, is, is terribly interested in that. Uh, the, the idea really is to create these mini, mini social movements at, at the local level, uh, where people are able to help themselves. So design is informed, not in an air conditioned office, but through a process of observation and dialogue. And implementation is informed by the participation of beneficiaries and a feed, a, a, a feedback loops with adaptive uh, implementation. Okay, so that's the overall approach of the social observatory. I have called it reflexive development uh, because there's a certain level of reflexivity involved in this, yeah? Or reflexive policymaking, if you like, yeah? But in this case, because of the development. What are the 
sort of three pillars of this, at least in the social observatories version of it. The first is uh, you know, very much like an RCT idea, but with certain caveats, long-term feedback. In other words, when we implement a policy, what do we learn about the outcomes? A, and secondly, how those outcomes were achieved. So when we do impact evaluations, and we do have done several RCTs, we couple that with ethnographic uh, process tracking to understand how those outcomes are, 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 are achieved. Uh, there's a paper I have on the anatomy of failure, uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about that. Yeah? And secondly, we had done a lot of work. In fact, I'm doing two books on that now, and I'll be talking a little about them, that in this talk, on what we call qualitative tracking. That is trying to see how change happens with extremely intense observation of the process of change, not through surveys, but through participant observation. Yeah? Secondly, we rely on everyday feedback. That is, it's not just you know, somebody flying in, doing a survey, running off, somebody does the implementation, you come back two years later, do another survey and see the impact, but you're there all the time. The researcher is in the project office all the time, observing, discussing, learning how things are done, and not management information systems, on decision support systems, and importantly on process monitoring. By the way, I know that uh, there are people at IAM Calcutta who study and do these things in the management side uh, of, 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 uh, uh, of the institute. Uh, so, so this is something that I think management people understand completely, econo economists only beginning to understand. Yeah? And thirdly, and very importantly, citizen and beneficiary feedback. We're constantly focused on trying to understand how citizens are reacting to whatever is going on and in their views into how design happens. So we are both, I mean, giving benefits and implementation and so on. Now, as I said, we've done uh, 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 quite a lot of things uh, along these lines, but I'm gonna highlight two. One is some work we did on uh, uh, sort of gender equality, and the second one is what we're calling participatory tracking that we did in Tamil Nadu. Now I'll talk about both these things and I'm happy to answer questions about other work that we have done and how, how this um, uh, has expanded in different ways. This is work we did some time ago. Let's start with Bihar. Now Bihar uh, in 2006, uh, in some ways this was the genesis of the social observatory, uh, started with the World Bank's uh, assistance, a project called Jivika, which was basically a self-help group movement for women in Bihar. And uh, we came in around 2010 uh, to evaluate the second phase of this, but we also looked retrospectively at the first phase of Jivika and, and how, it, how, it, how it worked and didn't work and so on. And, and uh, so I'll talk about a little more about the first wave. Now, uh, Jivika is now part of the larger NRLM, uh, which uh, also the social observatory was uh, very much involved with. Um, and um, and uh, uh, the goals of Jivika were sort of multifaceted, women's empowerment, poverty alleviation, building sustainable livelihoods. And the basic self-help group model, in case you don't know it, uh, it's actually now all over the country. It's, it's you start with a facilitated credit intervention where you mobilize women's self-help groups of about seven to 12 women, and you have about 10 or 15 such groups for village that is organized in a hierarchy, which is headed by a village organization, women-run village organization. And then of course you have uh, block level organizations, district level organizations and state level organizations. So it's a, it's, a, it's a structure, but you know, uh, in many ways, that credit intervention is uh, is uh, the metaphor that Jivika likes to use. is like building a highway. Yeah, once you set up these women's networks, you have the infrastructure, the human infrastructure in place to roll out various other anti-poverty programs, nutrition interventions, women-centered interventions, as Jivika has been doing a lot. Yeah, a lot of nutrition health interventions, uh, what what they call verticals. Very, very central to how Jivika works is the role of the facilitator or any of these community-based interventions rely on what they call a facilitator, which is somebody from the project who is essentially resident in the village where the project is happening, who helps implement the project at the village level. Yeah? So these are the frontline workers of Jivika and they tend to be often nowadays Jivika members themselves who have become facilitators. Yeah? So it's very much uh, a self. We did an impact I did an impact in this of, of 2015, the first that it had a huge impact. Uh, uh, savings uh, for, for these women grew by almost 300%, so three times. Uh, uh, the, the percentage of households with high cost loans, uh, high interest loans, uh, compared to 2008, went down by 
43%, the amount borrowed went down by 47%. And there were a lot of other impacts, uh, improvements, huge improvements in visiting panchayat meetings, going to the local shop, all in women. Yeah? So there's an enormous effect on women's empowerment that, that Upu uh, uh, studied in his dissertation and observed as part of the social observatory. Uh, it sort of had a remarkable impact on women's, uh, women's uh, 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 both, both, both in their sense of self, their sense of agency, uh, in, their, in their ability to, to, uh, to achieve livelihoods, uh, and of course on their credit. So that was the quantitative side of things. What I'm going to be talking about, uh, you can read the quantitative paper if you like, is, 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 is these uh, articles that I did with Parmita Sanyal and Sruti Majundar, uh, trying to understand how this happened. We know what happened, we know how much it happened, but how did it happen? And that is the qualitative piece that we're currently in the book. Uh, uh, sort of, uh, with some of the early work we did, but there's a working paper. So we worked with a subsample of the quantitative sample and we used you know, a difference in difference uh, uh, approach. So what we did is that we looked at the quantitative sample for the impact evaluation, which was basically a regression discontinuity that they designed that we had used. And we looked at the best paired matches from that discontinuity of villages, yeah? control and treatment villages. And then we, on the basis of field-based observation, we selected those matches even well. At the end, we, we collected data from six villages two villages from phase one of Jivika, two villages from phase two of Jivika, and, and two villages that were pure controls. Okay, So it's sort of a mix of qualitative uh, data collection, qualitative understanding with a sense of you know, quantitative design. What is important is that over a four year period, there were 12 cycles of data collection. So almost constant interview processes, four years of data collection where interview teams are going, Every three months, five people were going to these villages and observing, having interviews, talking to people, doing focus group discussions. And we talked to different types uh, of people. We talked to people who joined Jivika, those who didn't join, their husbands, uh, key stakeholders and beholders in the village, the mukhya, the various religious heads, village council members, money lenders, landlords, ward members. And of course, to understand implementation, we talked to Jivika staff themselves, the, the facilitators and various officials at different levels. Um, and enormous amount of different types of data that we did, that would be observed and worked. Okay, what were the findings? So Bihar in 2006, right up to 2010, it's getting better now. Uh, and this is not surprising, enormously uh, divided by caste uh, in the way that you might expect. Uh, and, and the main route to mobility was Srinivas's famous, uh, M.N. Srinivas's famous idea of sensitization, that is, you, the route out of mobility was, was, was by basically trying to imitate upper caste behaviors. If you get some money, you start sort of acquiring upper caste types of, uh, you know, um, uh, external attributes uh, to show mobility. That's how they started. In the public sphere, highly dominated by upper caste. Yeah? Uh, even in villages where there were reservations for lower caste, dominant caste, uh, generally, uh, the, uh, you know, from, 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 uh, uh, from the landed uh, caste. What Trent were calling the shots. Um, and of course, what characterizes Bihar today and then was an enormous amount of out migration and which brought in external money, uh, which means that there was a certain level of political empowerment for lower caste that came from that external money. Now, in countries, Jivika hadn't gone in. We found that this traditional thing still applied. This decision making dominated and dominated by in-laws, right? And in fact, women moving freely was seen as a as symptomatic of male deficiency. And power uh, masculine activities, yeah? Women will starve to death, but they will not leave the house. So that was the approach that we found, the attitudes we found in control villages to some of the things we used to sort of, uh, with the communities describe uh, those behaviors. What did Jivika do? When Jivika facilitators went into each village, they first did a thorough analysis of the village using sort of uh, rapid appraisals, you know, focus group discussions talking to the community to understand what is the power structure of the village. Yeah? What is the caste dynamic, land use patterns, money lending practices? Uh, what are the different types of interventions going on there? Then importantly, they went to the village elders, kids and husbands and so on, and started saying what Jivika was going to do and got their buy-in, got their acceptance of that intervention, basically saying, we're going to give you cheap credit. 
So the way Jeevika describes it, we saw the Desi chief credit as a bribe to allow women to enter the project. Okay. Remember, however, that because it was a project of the government of Bihar, highly backed up by the chief minister and the chief secretary, Nitish Kumar, and those uh, at now, but that was early Nitish Kumar, uh, it had a lot of power behind it, coming from the top. So when the village elders were sitting there, they were realized that this is coming from the chief minister himself. Yeah. So, so there was a lot of acceptance of that. And then they did what they called, the facilitators did what they call social mapping, identify key people in that village who can be the first movers, women who can turn into the eyes and ears of the community and help mobilize other women. Yeah. So uh, the second is process, the step they followed was the mobilization of women, the, what they called, what we can call the co-production of discourse. That is, you want to change how women think where they realize that women from different castes, different groups share one thing. They share the experience of poverty. And those shared experiences were discussed in these self-help groups to begin with. Their own narratives of struggle, their own narratives of poverty. And then that open discussion of how gender norms constrain women's participation from different castes. And then a certain self-empowerment process where self-help and was the end goal rather than jobs or cheap credit. It wasn't the economic as much as the social that was the end goal that the women themselves came up with. And that was co-produced. So they did it in their own language, in their own way. It wasn't something forced, but it sort of happened organically. Then there was a process of what we call the participatory identification of the poorest. Communities themselves got together and said, who are the poor families that should benefit first from whatever cheap credit is offered? And they were the first ones to enter the project and expanded from there. Step three was the ritualization of activities giving women their own passbooks, giving them a bank account, giving them a money box where they can handle money as members of a group, not their own household money, but the group's money. Um, and then of course, uh, engaging head on with the messy politics of the, of the panchayat yeah, in, in, in Bihar. The SAGs, women coming together had political clout within the village. You know, there's, there's, it's very interesting. If you look at wherever SAGs have become very prominent, Andhra Pradesh, Bihar and so on, Women have become a huge political force because the SCGs tend to be a vote bank in themselves. Women tend to be a vote bank in themselves. And that happens in every village. Yeah? And through repeated messaging, reiteration, uh, certain level indoctrination too. Yeah? So, the, so you would see them singing songs uh, about street theater, flip charts, and so on, treating Jivika as a way of life rather than a donor or a World Bank funded project. And that sort of resulted in a process by which women could make claims outside the household, that they felt empowered outside the household, that they had the community outside their own families and outside the household, but across different castes, across different groups, across different religions. Yeah? That, that self-help group identity becomes a primary identity. Yeah? And you know, so if that, <laughs> that one Mukhya in a village said, Nitish has turned women into men. And that's because Jivika, backed by political and cheap credit, gave women exclusive access to a set of physical, symbolic, and institutional resources, all of which were masculine, uh, 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 part of the masculine sphere prior to the project. So the point that Jivika shows is that these social norms cannot be changed in a short period of time. So all these papers you see norm changing within one, six months or a year, don't last. They happen for the period of the project. To have lasting norm change, you need a reiterative process of collective violation of behavioral injunction. In other words, it's got to be done again and then again and then again. And that's what enables the mini social movement. And if any of you go to any of the Jivika villages in Bihar now, you will see this continue. Yeah? This has not gone anywhere. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's been 15 years since the project started, 16 years almost. It's not going anywhere. Yeah? So, however, when Jivika expanded from phase one, which ended in 2010, and then phase two, which started 2011, where we came in, where it almost doubled the number of households it was uh, targeting. And now, of course, it's 6 million households. We noticed some issues. And we did a randomized trial of, of that, which is uh, a, a paper that was published last year in the JBE. You see that the savings uh, changes in those two years are smaller than the previous uh, uh, study we did. Uh, household uh, high debt has gone down, but by less. Uh, and you know, there's no really a big effect on women's empowerment in the short term in the second phase. So the first phase was fantastic. The second phase was good, but not as great. Yeah? And 
we did another piece of work to understand why, and I'm not going to go through that because of lack of time. But basically, the reason is that as you scale up, you start facing the challenges of scale, and we show, and that affects your implementation quality. Yeah, and that has a broader lesson, which is basically when you're trying to do an RCT or something on a on a new design, uh, the, the and you're basically assuming away implementation quality and scaling issues because that implementation uh, is at its best because the intervention is on a small space. To look at RCTs with implementations on large scale, that does happen. Karthik Muralidharan in particular has been doing a lot of good work in that uh, with the Aadhaar card and so on. But you need that type of sort of Karthik types of work to really get at an RCT at scale, which rarely happens. You don't see much of that. Yeah? So, but what we're showing here is that is very central. How does it work at scale? Now, over time, phase two, there's later work that uh, the others are doing. Phase two is getting better and better. Phase three is getting better and better. So Bihar is slowly figuring this out. Now, I'm going to shift tracks a bit and talk about work we did in, in Tamil Nadu, which is entirely different. And the idea here is a, is a, is a, is a sort of slightly different idea of empowerment. Uh, and it builds on some work that I've been doing for many years, a book I did called Oral Democracy with Paramita, uh, that looks at Gram Sabhas yeah, in the Panchayat system. We're now focusing on the Panchayat system rather than women's self-help groups. We're trying to find ways of, of empowering, empowering the panchayat system. And as you know, uh, you know, many of you are from West Bengal, and which has a very, very sort of powerful panchayat system with a whole bunch of well-studied issues and problems. Uh, keep in mind that every state is different. Yeah. So, so it's important when you understand panchayats uh, to understand that if, because, because at the end, panchayat law in every state is a state. Uh, 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 under the state's jurisdiction, it's, it's implemented differently. So here, Tamil Nadu is, is, is actually uh, a very different panchayat system than, than, than West Bengal. Uh, but we're working with the Tamil Nadu panchayat system, and, and let me explain what we did. The, the point here is, uh, is really this idea about what broadly you might call democratizing data. There's been a huge concern of mine and many people that surveys are essentially ways by which people like you and me can study others. Now, we are not from generally from very poor communities. We're generally middle-class people, sometimes richer than middle-class. We're very different from the people we're studying. We design some survey instruments sitting in some office. We go and hire a firm to do the survey, look at the data and, and you know, say things, this is what people are like. We wanted to change that. We wanted to give ordinary citizens the ability to collect and analyze their own survey data. So they can understand themselves with data, not for my purpose or somebody else's purpose. And our pilot, which I'll talk about now, is with 32,000 women in Tamil Nadu who belong to self-help groups in Tamil Nadu. Uh, it's now getting, getting expanded uh, to the whole state, uh, but, but let me talk about the pilot we did in 2014. So the first one is the development of the questionnaire. The development of the questionnaire was entirely community-based. We use these women's self-help group uh, networks in Tamil Nadu to sit and have discussions amongst themselves as to what are the issues they wanted to track in this questionnaire. They came up with their own questionnaire. And then we worked with them to shorten that questionnaire for 30 minutes so that you know, we had, it started out like all questionnaires do much longer, came down to 30 minutes. But it's really, it was their work to bring it down to 30 minutes. We didn't bring our ideas into it uh, at all. But, and this question is very different. If you look at the NSS questionnaire and the questionnaire that uh, uh, the, 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 the communities in Tamil Nadu developed, there's only a 17% overlap in questions. There is something called the World Bank LSMS Living Standards Measurement Survey. There's about a more of an overlap, overlap there. It covered a range of themes, well-being, livelihoods, economic welfare, food security, and uh, nutrition. But what is also important is how they frame the questions. And, and these are brilliant, some of them. Generally, in the NSS or some other standard survey, you'll get a question, how much do you spend on the purchase of vegetables in a month? Here, the question was, this, the women came up with, nothing to do with us. Does the person who eats last get enough to eat? Who is the person who gets, who eats last in most rural traditional households? It's the woman uh, of the household. The question is, does she get enough to eat? Does she go to sleep hungry? And that allowed the communities to identify fa uh, families that were truly going through uh, hardship, going through and, and suffering from hunger. We generally ask questions, what was your age at the time of marriage? Here they ask, did you marry your relative? Was your decision taken into account at the time of your marriage? 
we generally ask empowerment questions, who makes decisions on assets and loans, they ask, do you decide on what flows to where based on your own preferences? And of course they ask for domestic violence. Remember this was early days with mobile uh, phone uh, access in India. So digital participation was very important for them. They asked the women, can you use a mobile phone on your own? Can you read and send uh, text messages? Yeah, which was a big empowering thing back in 2014. Yeah. The second was community-based data collection and management. This was entirely done by women members. We, we developed an app for them on a tablet. They used the tablet, they, they uh, uh, dominated one of their members to go to every household in the village and ask the questions. That tablet was designed in such a way that nobody had a, any chance of interfering with the data collection. The data was entered in the tablet, dispatched to a cloud server. So nobody ever saw the data till, till it came back to them, which I'll talk about in a second. And it was designed for users with low digital uh, literacy. Yeah? Then we importantly visualized the data. So even an illiterate person could, could understand what the data is saying. So look at the screen. This is the screen that the village sees when we present it back to them, you see a banana tree. That is the uh, nutrition uh, uh, indicator. You see these assets here. Can you see my cursor, by the way, Imadri? Are you able to see my cursor? Uh, not really. Not really. Yeah, okay. I can see I can see it now. You I mean, can see it now, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, mm. so you can see the assets here. You see a, a, a goat, you see a fridge, you see a house, you see a scooter. You see, uh, this is about sort of intra-household decision-making. This is about sanitation. Uh, this is about women's mobility, women handling of cash. Now, what is interesting about the screen, you can see that goes from gray to very colorful. So the way we designed the visualization was if the average of that indicator was better, you saw more color. So you can immediately see in this particular village that women's digital literacy is very bad because it's gray, while nutrition is quite good in this particular village because it's much greener. Yeah. So, so, so immediately the village can see where their major problems are in the spheres that they're interested in. Now let me drill down a bit to one of these indicators. Let's go to the intra-household decision-making indicator comparing two villages side by side. Here, the way we showed it was if women had a particular say, their face became bigger. If the man had a, more of a say, his face became bigger. Yeah? And so you know, on each of these decisions, you can compare these two villages side by side. You see, for instance, who makes decisions regarding when to visit your parents' house? Agamalai village has a much bigger women's uh, uh, say there. Not surprisingly, it's a tribal village. Well, Manatakodasai has much more men's say in the subject. Men's faces are much bigger. Yeah? And you can, so the, the communities can immediately see, you know, we need to improve in this sphere. Now, this is the asset thing. And the asset thing is, 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 is again, we're showing you two villages side by side. Uh, for, and remember, this is, this is uh, you know, 30 to 1,000 households. Here, what the, the, the way to look at this and the way is again, I can be understood by even an illiterate person. Each of these indicators is an asset that they have talked about, whether it's a chicken, a goat, a house, a fridge, a television set, you know, crops, whatever. If there is a red box around that, that means they have lost that asset in the previous year. If there is a green box, that means they have gained the asset in the previous year. If there is no box, that means they have neither gained or lost that asset in the previous year you can immediately see that the right-hand village is doing much better economically than the left-hand village. Okay, immediately you can see that. So the left-hand village has some work to do. Uh, this is a flower thing. They were very interested in marriage and so on and those issues. And this flower visualization borrows from the stem and leaf plot, which you might have seen in Stata. The height of the flower is the age at marriage. If it's a red flower, that means you married a relative. A yellow flower, that means you didn't marry a relative. If the flower is a bud, that means you, your say was not taking into account in arranging a husband for you. If it's an open bud, your say was taken into account. Then the leaves are the number of children you have. And this is a random draw uh, from each of these villages. So you can see immediately that the, the tribal village actually does pretty badly from their perspective in marrying relatives. They're marrying very much within, within the relative context, while the right-hand side village does a lot better. Yeah? Age at marriage is high in the right-hand side village. So, what this is showing, if you just compare just some of these three things or going back to the big screen, you know, these two villages are good in some, better in some things, worse than others. It's not one standard story that um, um, uh, Manala Kudasai is a better village than Agamale. They're good at some things, they're worse than other things, right? So what is very important is all of these visualizations were presented to the village in a Gram Sabha meeting. And then that allowed the women's groups along with the panchayat 
to make budgetary decisions about where to allocate money to improve their well-being. Yeah? So that feedback process is very, very central to, to participatory tracking. Now, what's going on now? What, I mean, where has this gone from 2014? Firstly, you know, it creates a citizen-based narrative of, of data and poverty and well-being. It's not designed by some well-trained economists. It's designed by regular, everyday people uh, trying to understand how they're doing. It incidentally produces high frequency data. You can do this every six months and it's a census. Yeah, it's a census you can do every six months. And importantly, now where this is going is to expand this from individual outcomes to public goods, to common property using digital maps and so on. And it's being now designed and implemented all over Indonesia, all over Nepal. Uh, Karnataka has taken it up. Tamil Nadu has already put it in its budget as something to do. COVID has put a bit of a damper on some of this, but hopefully, uh, it'll get moving soon. So it's, it's now picking up around the world, yeah? And uh, so I, I wanna, I'm gonna sort of take a bit of a look. I gave you two brief glimpses following what we're calling this reflexive development idea as a sort of an alternative to the three dominant practices in policymaking, which is uh, neoliberalism, neo-Keynesianism, and neo-paternalism. Uh, and this is a more reflexive approach. What we're doing now, one of the things that we are working on with the Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, uh, and also in Nepal, to some extent in India, is trying to understand well-being by talking to people directly in open-ended conversations. So instead of me doing a survey about you know, what your expenditures were in the last month and assessing from that whether you're below the poverty line or above it, I have a long conversation with you, a half an hour conversation about how you're doing. With, you know, and those, that conversation is then analyzed by our uh, natural language processing methods by machine learning to assess your well-being. This, this is a method we're working on. Uh, I'm working to, to, with the government of Karnataka to, to uh, improve their panchayat uh, decision-making and the COVID management. We are producing a book on this, what they're calling the business of democracy. We are, we are working on the big, big decentralization process that's going on in Nepal. So this is all ongoing work uh, that, that we'll be working on and we'll be producing stuff from uh, over the next uh, couple of years. So to conclude, a reflexive development is not easy. It is a slow, slow process. It requires much more direct engagement between the researcher and those you are researching. It requires researchers to have the capacity to listen and communicate and not think they're smarter than everybody else. Yeah? It requires humility. And importantly, it requires a tolerance of mess. It's not all clean. Messiness is how the world works. It's okay. Yeah? And it's not just, just about the equality of opportunity. We're saying equality of opportunity is very important, but also about the equality of agency and voice. It is compatible with the other three approaches, but emphasizes citizen state dialogue and deliberation. It is intrinsically interdisciplinary. One thing I really get mad about is when economists start thinking they're smarter than the other social, social sciences and do not collaborate with them. I think that is an idiotic thing and completely against any principle of good science. Yeah? The principle of co-production, co-producing policy design with citizens, you intrinsically think of the good life as not being some welfare income metric or expenditure metric, but it is multidimensional, yeah? And really, it is not just about poor countries, it can happen in rich countries too. So what we're trying to do is to, is to actualize this idea of reflexive development via how we work uh, uh, with uh, projects uh, 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 around the world. All right, let me stop there and I will stop sharing. And, uh, uh, and, uh, Happy to answer any questions uh, that, that you may have. Yeah, thank you uh, so much, uh, Dr. Rao, for this uh, great presentation. And actually, kudos to the great uh, work being carried out by your uh, team of uh, Social Observatory in uh, not only putting research to practice, but also recognizing the importance of uh, process over outcomes, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, we'll uh, take some of the questions. Uh, there's one on the chat box currently. I'll ask the others if, if you have. You can raise your hand or put them on the chat box. Uh, so I think it's Chandray Kumar who asked, uh, was any behavioral bias estimation done uh, as part of the GVCA project to understand the behavioral uh, barriers, problems related to attention or belief formulation choice or determination that individuals were facing that acted as an inhibitor for the desired uh, behavior? And she also asked for, for some paper suggestions uh, with respect to the neo-paternalism approach of uh, social observatory. Uh, 
Thank you, Chandri. Uh, just to clarify, the neo-paternalism approach is not the socialist liberties approach. It is the approach that is currently, I think, the dominant approach, which is the behavioral approach and the RCT approach. There's a lot written on that, as you know, that you can read about. If you want to read a paper where I basically summarize what I just talked about, that is the paper that I talked about in the beginning of the presentation, which is in Daedalus. Uh, if you just Google my name and Daedalus, it pops right out. It's an open access paper. Uh, it's called Reflective. Uh, it's called process outcomes versus policy outcomes or something. There's, there's some kind of title. Anyway, I'm, I, I, I can share it later. Now, on your other question about whether we studied uh, sort of behavioral uh, constraints uh, in Jivika, we did. That was work I did with Tahidur Rahman and Carla Hoff. Uh, it's not published yet, but there is a working paper out there. If you just, again, Google Hoff, Rahman, and Rao, it'll pop right up. And it tells you about how Jivika members, before the intervention, uh, sort of some of the things that we saw in the qualitative work sort of studied more behaviorally. That was there. Uh, we also uh, tried to understand how those outcomes changed with the intervention and, and as you might uh, expect, uh, things got better. Thanks. Uh, I hope uh, there will be questions as we go along. Uh, Dr. Rao, let me ask, like having worked uh, briefly at the uh, community level myself, uh, I've often heard there's a, co a common complaint in um, in these studies, uh, I mean, especially at the community level, uh, that they say that we have so many such interventions going around, but nothing really changes on ground. So uh, how, have, how has your team uh, gone about addressing those issues and whether at all you have faced uh, this complaint when you've uh, worked on ground? Not only have I faced the complaint, I've written a book uh, on that complaint. <laughs> so okay. it's called Localizing Development. It was a book I wrote in 2013, assessing the state of community driven projects around the world, finding that they work very badly, primarily because they do not follow this reflexive approach. I mean, they do the community development intervention like they do a bridge building intervention or you know some other school building intervention, yeah, like an infrastructure intervention. They don't give the time for the dialogic, in, uh, you know, exchange. They don't do co-production. They, uh, they, you know, they don't involve communities at all, yeah, and they don't know how to do adaptive implementation, which is very very important. So they work very badly. I got into a lot of trouble at the World Bank for writing that book because I said eighty-five billion dollars of World Bank projects are, you know, absolute bakwas. Yeah? So so. Yes, which is why I started the social observatory to correct that. <laughs> okay, now you'll see the projects that we have done. Jivika is an NRLM generally, I think, are very, uh, rel not very, relatively uh, well done projects. Yeah, uh, in Bihar and in some states like Jharkhand, certainly in Andhra Pradesh, certainly in Kerala, to some extent in Rajasthan, many parts of the country in India, and now other parts of the world, these self-help group interventions are actually becoming quite powerful and quite well ensconced. Uh, in Bihar anyway, which was the one of the uh, early states that adopted this, I think the social observatory was able to make a difference by introducing these ideas and other states have taken it up uh, subsequently, yeah? It is still true that, you know, there are lots of, I mean, every NGO, everybody does want, wants to do some work and you, you I mean, it's, which is fine, you know, and in fact, NGOs, because they're working at a small scale, are able to do a better job because of many NGOs will work with, say, 10 villages, yeah? Government projects work with 6,000 villages or maybe even more, yeah? And that's, it's the scale problem, right? And, and, and so, the, so our really, our issue is, of course, we can inform how NGOs do their work, but NGOs kind of do this all the time, what we're saying, because they're doing it at a small scale. But how do you take that, if you wish, an effective NGO approach and make it applicable to a large government project? That's where reflexive development comes in. How do we, what, what, I mean, and I think there's a lot more work that can be done in that. We've just sort of touched the surface. Yeah, there, there's a lot more thinking that can be done. Yeah, and, and, and also the fact that uh, the World Bank often uh, sponsors these projects, which are often taken up by the, uh, say, consulting organizations uh, in India and other countries. Uh, so has there been any kind of, uh, I mean, recognition by the World Bank on these issues by uh, tying the by maybe tying the aid with some of these uh, reflexive ideas and the and the neo uh, paternalistic uh, paradigm that you uh, talked about. Honestly, in word more than deed, yeah, and and a uh, lot more can be done. A lot more can be done. Yeah, so I hope that by writing about it and by giving talks like this. 
me and others can raise awareness a little bit, but certainly a lot more can be done. In places where it's getting better, by the way. So, so for instance, um, if you look at uh, ID Insight, which is the big organization in India, they are following some of these practices in their work. Yeah. Three IE is trying to observe some of these ideas. Yeah. So, so, so yes, it is slowly changing. If you look at the Ministry of Rural Development in in Delhi, uh, they are now trying to build better MIS systems. The Panchayati Raj uh, office in Delhi just sent a letter to all the states talking about how to empower Gram Sabhas. So, I think these ideas are slowly coming in. NRLM certainly is doing it, and that's a you know that's a nationwide project. So, these ideas are coming in. Is it becoming the norm? Is it dominant? Absolutely no way. We are reflexive development is the fourth category. Yeah? It's the least uh, done category because it's the hardest. And that's the issue. It's the hardest to do. Yeah? And it directly confronts those messy facts that the government likes to control, that likes to ignore. That the dominance of elites, the corruption, all those things that we know exist, we take it on head on. We're saying it's that's life. How do we correct it by making communities more involved? Rather than saying, let's assume it doesn't exist and then have some nice tax model that explains you give panchayats taxing authority that wonderful things will happen. Yeah? Or they'll be sort of following a Downsian model and voting with their feet and getting out. These issues are irrelevant on the ground in policymaking. They might clear your head and reading a paper and textbook, but following those theoretical models in how you do practice will result in horrible practice because they don't reflect the real world. Yeah. Right. So will it be fair to say, say, uh, for the subject of economics as a whole, when you talked about process and outcomes, uh, when, it, when it comes, I mean, as much as my brief understanding of your talk goes, uh, with the, especially the process approach, it's the uh, ethnographic approach or the anthropological approach which works better, but with respect to the outcomes, it's where economics comes into the picture. Yeah, that's one way of thinking, that's a good way of thinking about it. I, I would say the following. The way at least I have tried to do my work is to not try to make a distinction between economics, appro an economics approach, an anthropological approach, a political science approach. These are all ways of doing social science. Yeah. Right. In fact, I mean, I have a great belief. I mean, you know, I mean, not just me. Look at Jean Dres's book. I mean, Jean Dres is an anthropologist dressed like an economist, or really, <laughs> he dresses like an anthropologist also. But you know, his his work is very much grounded in in these perspectives. Uh, and of course, you know, even if you look at your own state, uh, look at the work of Ashok Rudra, look at the work of Pranabda, Pranab Bardhan. I mean, uh, you know, th this, this is a long tradition in India about doing these things. Mine is just latest incarnation of that, yeah? I want to make it sexy again, man. I want people to realize that this can be publishable because by doing people some good, you will also get some benefit. Now, the problem is that the economics profession is so dominated by, you know, what, Heckman is called top five itis. Yeah, we have to publish in these top five. That everybody does the same bloody thing. Everybody is writing the same bloody RCT. Everybody citing the same bloody people. Yeah, that nothing gets done. This is not about your career. Why are we all in this profession to make other people's lives better? Not our own necessarily. I mean, our own will happen, but the main purpose is to make other people's lives better. You sit and you just worry about your own career. Why don't you join a firm, sell soap? Don't be a development economist. So having gone on that rant, I'm trying to give some ideas about how we can all make our work more relevant and more effective. Yeah, yeah. thank you for being uh, so brutally honest. Uh, uh, I am waiting for anyone else, if uh, anyone else has a question. Uh, otherwise, maybe we can uh, call the session a close. I don't see any questions right now. Uh, maybe people are just uh, very new to this idea, so they are kind of consuming it late. But uh, Dr. Rao, I think it's been a fabulous session. Uh, I mean, we obviously recognized a completely new paradigm, a new approach to doing economics and hope uh, many of us get inspired uh, following your path and maybe uh, get published in the top tier journals uh, looking at your work. Thank you, Madhya. I, 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 and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. Let me make it clear. This is not a new approach. This is okay. not a new approach. It's a very, very old approach. I'm simply trying to give it a label, trying to show you what can happen, what the potential is. Yeah, but it's not a new approach. But the, thank you very much. I, the top five, I mean, publishing in top journals should not be the purpose of our lives. But I just wish that there would be a way of earning a living 
as an economist without publishing in those journals. It, unfortunately, that's not the case. So I understand constraints you are in, but thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you. And uh, you know, hopefully we'll have more uh, opportunities later. A pleasure is all ours. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Uh, thank thank you, you, the audience, for joining. Uh, okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye.